started. Let me turn off my. Here we go. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning. And, um, so, um, uh, yes, uh, I'll get started. So, uh, in, in the recording, I think I've turned my recording on. And um, then uh, the uh, the video will be available for everybody who may come on later. Okay, um, I've got a, another set of uh, processing uh, codes to to go through. And um, so I guess I'll get started here. Let's see. Let me do my screen sharing. Uh, there. Okay, now let me see here. Let me turn off my music. Okay, here is uh, here's my first uh, set of uh, processing code for uh, for class today, and all I'm doing here is illustrating the different kinds of variables that you might have in processing. I already talked about this a little previously when I talked about uh, integer variables and floating point variables <coughs> and excuse me um, so i want to talk about that a little bit more uh, showing you more of the different kinds of variables in processing <coughs> and um, <coughs> uh, sorry <coughs> um, just going to clear out my uh, my throat, my lungs here, even though I got up like an hour ago, um, there was nobody to talk to. So uh, I, I didn't have a chance to sort of clear out my throat. So you people were the first people I'm talking with today. So um, you get to help me do that. OK, so all the different kinds of variables here. I began, I've already talked about integer variables. And integer variables go from uh, go only go through integer values, and they can be negative integers, positive integers, or zero. Um, and um, uh, ordinary integer variables uh, have 32 bits. Uh, in other words, every number, every integer number, is represented by 32 bits in the in in the um, process in the computer so we have a total of two raised to the 32nd power number different number a different how many different integer variables we can represent with 32 bits and um, so integer variables now, there are also character variables. Uh, character variables you can think of as being letters. Um, and um, of course, we're restricted. Uh, the processing will handle uh, however many letters are generally recognized um, in uh, um, by the computer world. We have uh, the, the English or Latin alphabet, we have the Greek alphabet, we have the Russian alphabet, we have many uh, Chinese, uh, Japanese, and you know, symbols like that from the Far East, um, and um, the Arabic alphabet. So it's however many, uh, and also there are, uh, there are characters which are not alphabetical characters, such as comma, period, quotation marks, 
parentheses, plus and minus signs, and so on, that are legitimate character variables. And uh, so a character variable is one, um, it's a variable like that. Here I'm representing it as, here you see a lowercase a um, that uh, I use in the English alphabet. Um, the, um, let's see if there's something else I want to say. Yes, there are character variables which are not printed. For example, a space is a character variable. A carriage return is a character variable. So, you know, we're writing a document in Word. We have the letters that we're using for the words. We have the punctuation marks that we're using. And, um, and then a carriage return and the space that goes between the letters are also uh, character variables. And um, in the beginning, many, many years ago, uh, when computers were first uh, being used, and believe it or not, I was around then, and um, that uh, there were all the character variables had um, uh, what are called ASCII codes. And um, so each variable was represented by a uh, a number. Let me let me pull that up. Let me here. Let's see here. I want to pull up ASCII table. So I don't know if you can see this shows all the characters, all 128 characters in the beginning that were represented. So there, it was the, the, the numerals, uh, uh, zero through nine, uppercase letters in the English alphabet, lowercase letters, and punctuation marks, spaces, and so on. There were only 128. Okay, in the very beginning, uh, as computers were being first developed in from Great Britain and uh, the uh, United States, is that uh, uh, they were the only ones using these very, very early computers. So they didn't represent any other uh, alphabets. Now, now today, um, we have many of the world's alphabets are represented. Plus emojis also have uh, numbers. There are more than 128 uh, by far. I'm trying to remember how many I should know, um, but I don't remember exactly how many. Um, and there are still unassigned numbers, uh, and there's a, a committee that gets together to determine uh, if somebody proposes a new emoji character they get and they get on. They determine if there should be uh, an assignment uh, for that new emoji character. So every time we get new emoji characters, um, it's because this committee has authorized that. Um, you know, the co committee is not um, does not report to any government or whatever. They're kind of a just a, a democratic committee and. And people agree with their uh, uh, decisions um, uh, just because they agreed to do it. Uh, if there's no sort of legal binding uh, situation going on there, which is still a way a, a lot of, of of computer things are decided. You know, for example, you know who uh, gets an IP address and so on are also decided by such committees. There's no government that controls these things. It's, it's a, a group of people with common interests get together, make the decisions, and then everybody in the group agrees to uh, go along with those decisions. And it's similar with uh, assigning variables. Now, they're not called ASCII codes or, or universal codes, let's see. Um, let me come back here. 
Um, let me go back to my processing. Here we go. OK, so characters. Um, now we have uh, floating point variables. I'm jumping from character down to here. Uh, floating point variables, characters, I mean, integers only represent integers. If we have numbers that are fractions, we use a floating point representation. Still, floating point variables are only represented with 32 bits in the computer. Um, now, the difference between an integer and a floating point is that a floating point uh, we represent um, fractions with decimals. Um, and uh, I am going to go into the details of how that's represented in the computer. Uh, but um, the, the, if there's a 32-bit word in the computer is used to represent each floating point variable. And it's assigned to the variable uh, into in such a way that allows the variable to represent um, fractions rather than only integers. Now, if you have a question about how that's done, uh, I'll be glad to talk about it in a later lecture. You can uh, uh, send me that. Uh, you know, send me a question and I'll talk about it. Um, and um, uh, but there's a, a lot that's involved in just how we represent. In computer words and it, it, it is set up in a certain way that is supposed to make it easier to do computations with these numbers in the computer. Um, now if 32 bits isn't good enough. Here, let me come back here. Let me see. With a 32-bit uh, word in processing, I don't know if you can read this on your screen, but uh, we can represent numbers that go from about um, three and a half times 10 to the 38th all the way down to negative three and a half times 10 to the 38. But it's possible we can get numbers larger than that that we need to represent. And if, if that happens, we use what's called a double precision number. So that's what double is here. It's a number that's represented by 64 bits in the computer rather than 32 bits. So we use twice as many bits, hence the term double precision. And um, OK, so integer, character, float, double. And there are, are Boolean types of variables which only take on true and false values, or plus one and minus one, for example, is, is, are the only values that they take. And these are Boolean variables are used for doing various types of logical um, uh, computations in the program. By, by that I mean you know, true and false kinds of things. If this is true and that is true, is this other thing true? So the kinds of, of, of questions you might deal if you were taking a course on logic, that's what you deal with when you do use Boolean variables. So Boolean variables only take on two values, true and false, unlike integer and floating point and double precision and character. Um, now, when we declare a variable type, now not all computer languages require that we declare variable types. Uh, uh, some of the more uh, uh, recent languages such as um, uh, um, Python, uh, we don't need to declare variable types. But in languages like C and Java and, and, and going as far as I can remember, basic Fortran, 
um, you have to declare variable types. In other words, before you use a variable, you're supposed to say what kind of variable it will be. And so in particular, we have to say, is it going to be a floating point variable? So here I say float X, declaring X to be a floating point variable. Now we can just leave it like that and put our semicolon here. But in this particular case, X is defined at least initially. It could be changed later in the program, but initially it's defined to be 4, 4.0. So it's a uh, what's called in the computer. Sometimes you call it a real because it has a fractional part rather than an integer. And we call it say float X equals 4.0. So we declare a value initially for float X, but it can be changed later. We can declare it but Y to be a floating point variable and don't have to assign it a value. OK, so we in either case, they're still declared to be a floating point variable. And then after I declare it to be a floating point variable in another statement, I said Y is equal to X plus 5.2. So here I'm defining the value of Y. And again, it can be changed. It can be changed later. Um, it can, it'll be changed um, uh, uh, in the process of running the program. Um, here, for example, I'm declaring a floating point variable Z. And I'm saying Z is equal to X times Y plus 15. So um, you are not required to, to put a statement which gives you a value when you declare a variable to be floating or integer. Like up here, I say integer count. Count is an integer variable and set to be zero. And character letter, we can define letter as a character variable. We don't have to initialize it to have the value A, which is what's happening here. So putting values is not necessary, but is often done when we declare variable values. Now in processing, this is often done in the setup code that we put in the very beginning of the processing program. So within setup, we might set the graphic window size. We also might declare variables. So even if we don't give the variable a value though, any variables that we use have to be declared in the program before we use them. Okay, they don't have to be declared right at the beginning of the program, but they have to be declared before we use them or we will get an error. So for example, let me run this program here. Um, uh, and uh, run it. And this program doesn't do anything, right? It's just assigning variables here. There's nothing being produced. We have this small window that's empty. Now here I have Y is equal to X plus 5.2. If I comment out the statement where I'm declaring Y to be floating point and now run it, I get an error. Here, come on. Because I'm using Y oh, down here, I'm using Y, but I haven't declared it. That's what's going on here. Y cannot be resolved to a variable. Why? Why is that? Because I haven't declared it to be a variable like that. Then I uncomment and run and everything is fine. OK, so much for variables. OK, now. Let me come back here. I lost my place, computer science for poets. Lesson four, example 4.2. Okay, here's my next piece of code. Using variables. 
Um, now here, notice I'm declaring my variables even before void setup. Integer circle X equals 100. Integer circle Y equals 100. Okay, don't yet know how I'm using circle X, circle Y. Could be the diameter uh, of a circle in an ellipse statement. It could be position. I don't know it's how I'm using these two variables isn't clear yet. And my void setup where I set up size here. Now I have my void draw, which you remember, this is executed over and over and over and over again. Set my background of the window to be 255. Um, if I draw a figure, the figure has a boundary, which is black, stroke zero. I'm filling it with a gray level 175. Now I'm using the variable to specify the location of an ellipse. So that's what's going on here. And this is the X and Y diameter of the ellipse. So I run. So here we have this. Now, well, let me change this to 200. There. And now I run. So this has moved over now to 200 where it was at 100 before. OK. I don't know that there's anything more to talk about with that particular example. Let me close it. And come back here. Here we go. Now, OK, I'm declaring variables again here. and Let's see how we use them. Um, circle X equals 0, circle Y equals 100. Void setup is the size of the window. The background of the window is white. The boundary of, of the figure is black, filling with gray. Circle X, circle Y. And now I. Changing the value of the cir of circle X by one. Here I'm saying circle X equals circle X plus one. So what happens here is this. I initially set circle X to be zero. First time through void draw. It draws an ellipse using circle X to be zero and circle Y to be 100 here. After it draws the ellipse, it changes the value of circle X to circle X plus one. So the value of circle X is now changed from zero to one. And remember that void draw executes over and over and over again. But now the value of circle X is set to one for the second time through void draw. So it goes through, does the background and the stroke and the fill. Now it draws an ellipse, but the value of circle X is one instead of zero, which is what it was previously. Circle Y hasn't changed. So it's drawn, you know, it draws another ellipse with a slightly different location. Then it adds one to the value of circle X. So the, va the new value of circle X will now be two. It goes back up, runs void draw again, plots the ellipse with the X value circle X to be two. So let's see what happens when we run this code. So you see every time through void draw, it increments the value of circle X, which gives you the X position of the ellipse that we're drawing. And you can see that causes the circle to move across the screen. So previously when we talked about how void draw allows us to animate things, this is the process which in which it allows us to animate things. So it's because the value of circle X is incremented by one 
every time through void draw. So it keeps drawing a circle, an ellipse, that slightly uh, has a different X position value than, um, than it did um, previously. Now, let's just try something interesting here. Let me change, let me add circle X here to this. So I have 50 plus circle X. So in this case, not only am I changing the position, but I'm changing the X diameter of the circle. Now I could also change this by plus circle X, the Y diameter. So I'm changing the position, the X position of the circle and the X and Y diameters of the circle. Let's run this. And you see the circle gets bigger as it moves to the right. OK, pretty. So we can do, we use the fact that the draw function, let's run this one. So only the Y position is changing. Okay, things are starting to get exciting now. Okay, I think I was three to four. Okay, now say I call this example many variables. So I have eight variables. They're all floating point variables, circle X, circle Y. And uh, these could be the width and the height of the circle, circle stroke, circle fill, background color, float change. So let's just quickly look through this. Basic setup, I set up the size. Let me run it first. Uh, this is complicated enough. It might be helpful to see what's going on. So there we go. Okay. So change. 0.5. So notice every time through void draw, I set the background, background color, 255. That stays 255. Circle stroke stays circle stroke. It doesn't change. Circle fill, circle X, circle Y, circle W, circle H. These all change here. Then here, circle stroke changes. And here, circle fill changes. So all these other variables here, every time through void draw, they're changed. Circle X is increased by the value of change. Circle Y is increased by the value of change. So those are the X and Y positions. The width and the height of the circle, here the width is increased, but the height is decreased. The stroke, that's the you know the 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 uh, the perimeter of the circle is changed, and the fill is changed. So uh, the the gray level on the fill is changed. So let's look at this again. So we see the y is decreasing, and notice what happens when it goes negative. The fill is changing, and while you can't really see what's happening to the circle stroke here clearly on that diagram right there. We could experiment. Um, I could, um, let's see here, I mean, we're making circle stroke smaller. Um, 
So something I might do here, let me take this out. So I could just comment this out, right? There, comment it out. And copy and put in a new command. But I'm not going to do this. Let me put a semicolon. And let me double circle stroke two times. So circle stroke is doubling every time through void draw. And boy, something's going on there, right? You agree with me? And um, so now uh, it might be worth your investigating. Let me go back to my original. Let me just comment this out and uncomment this out. So we keep there here, we're keeping the uh, the boundary of the circle while the interior of the circle is turning white. And when we did this, it's like the whole circle kind of disappeared on us. In other words, it went white and the stroke also disappeared on us. So, you know, now, this is the kind of thing that if you're really curious as to how this is working, I mean, what I do when I come across something like this is I go in and I start making small changes to see how that affects the execution of the program to help me understand exactly what, what might be happening sort of under the surface here as I'm changing things. So, this is a good example of the fact that void draw loops over and over and over again, and how we can change the values of variables each execution of void draw. So let's go back and look at this again. What happens if I make this, let's make it 0.5? So I'm making reducing circle stroke by a half. You can clearly see the boundary here. OK, so that is, I would say, might be worth a little bit of investigation. OK, now. We go on to the next example. Okay, more variables. We talk about system variables. So there are certain variables which are, in fact, predefined for certain things in processing. Um, Fill um, is, is a function, tells us what gray level or color we're using to fill a, a shape. A frame count is, as we're executing draw over and over again, the frame number is changing. So first time through, the frame zero. Second time through, is frame one third time through frame two. Now, here, frame count is used to keep track of that. So we're taking the fill and we're increasing it by frame count divided by two here. Okay, so frame count is a variable used by the system and we're here actually using it in our program, rect mode center, and then this is 
width, height, mouse X, mouse Y are also system variables. Width and height are variables that, deter that are determined by the size of the window, the width of the window and the height of the window. So these define width and height, I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong, but uh, I, I'm think, I think that's what's going on there. Mouse X, mouse Y are the position of the window. Uh, we have a void key pressed, okay, and every key has a value, has a number in the system. So every time we press a different key, um, we're getting, uh, uh, and we're printing which key we're pressing. Let's see what happens here. I run this. Now notice mouse X, mouse Y. As I move the mouse around, we're getting the width and height of the rectangle is changing because of that. Um, now, the center of the rectangle is determined by the width and height of the window. So the center of the rectangle is not changing. It's determined by the, it's so we're always drawing the rectangle in the center of the window. But you see the, the width and the height change depending on how we move the mouse. Now, we're not doing, we're not, what are we doing here? Let me just press a key. I press a key, I press lowercase g, so it's printing out the key that I pressed. There, let me press a nine. There, are nine. So this is printing out the value of the key that I pressed. Okay, right there, print line. Now print line, every time it prints something, it's printing on a new line. If I take out the LN, what happens here? Just do a print. Now run. Now notice every time I hit a key, it does it on the same line. It doesn't skip to a new line. So that's what putting the LN does. It makes it skip to a new line. Okay, so that's a that's I I I don't know why, but I think that's a, a neat effect there, what's happening. So you see the, the important thing here is the fact that void draw executes over and over again. And we can change the values of variables as void draw executes over and over again. It gives us a lot of flexibility to add animation uh, to what we draw in processing. There, now let me go do the next one. Oh, which one was that? I think it was this one, right? Let me just double check. Yeah, let me go to six. Ellipse with variables, declare and initialize your variables. They're all floating point here, everything. R, G, B, A, Diam. Now, one of the things I've learned over the years is that when I'm writing a program, usually what I do is I will name the variable. Notice that the variable doesn't have to be a single letter like you use in algebra or calculus, but we can give them long complicated names. So I have found it's generally better to actually write out exactly what the variable is, okay? So RGBA, if I'm going through the program, it's not clear what uh, what RGBA means. But if I want this to be a red value, a green value, and a blue value, what I would do is actually write float red equal 100, float green equal 150, and then I would use that down here. That way, immediately I look at the program and I, and I know what the variables are representing. 
uh, RGB is, doesn't convey that much information. And this may not be important when you're first writing the program because you'll just remember what you intended those variable values to mean. But when you go back in a week or two weeks or six months, you won't remember what you want those variables to mean. And by making it as clear as possible, that helps. I also use, I overload my program with comment statements. And even today, I probably still don't do it enough. But you can get comment statements to describe what each line does. That's often what I do. So I might write right here. Uh, if I didn't write float r equal to 100, I'll say uh, define red value, something like that. I can put a comment statement right on the line with the program e executable statement. And this is OK. I don't get an error for that. So here I have RGBA. Remember, A is sort of a transparency value. Um, I'm filling with red, green, blue, and defining a transparency. I'm drawing an ellipse. There, remember the fourth argument of the color is transparency. Use those variables to draw an ellipse. So we can define variables here and then use the variables as we define shapes in the program. So I run. And there we go. Okay. It's, it's not a particularly complicated program. OK. Now, we're running right through these, 4, 7. OK, again, defining it looks like red, green, blue, and transparency. Diameter X and Y usually mean position. And now I'm defining them to be random numbers. Random is a built in function in processing. So random number. Um, now uh, I'm trying, I don't exactly remember. This is probably generating a random number between 0 and 255. So I'm just as likely to get a 6 as a 100. So I'm generating random colors. And um, the diameter is random from 0 to 20. X is random depending from 0 to the width of the window. Y is random from 0 to the height of the window. I'm drawing an ellipse with all of these random values. And I'm giving them a random color. Wow, this uh, this should be interesting to see what this does, right? Let me run. Look at that. That is really cool. So you see the position, the size, the fill, the color. Everything is random. It's spreading everything out across the whole window at random. The size is random, the fill is random, so um, so think about it. If we didn't do the color, that could almost be you could do that could be raindrops on a window, for example. So um, you might be getting to get some idea how we can use these. Um, all these strange, you know, computer weenie, computer weenie is a person that likes to do computers. I'm a computer weenie. Uh, computer, that's, that's my own term. I don't know that it's, anyone else uses it. You can use these strange computer weenie things to do some interesting things in your graphics. Um, and uh, the only way you get good at it is by playing with it. I don't know, you know, it's like the example I've given before. I could give you a great lecture on how to play the piano, but you wouldn't leave the lecture being able to play the piano any better. So same thing with writing code. 
I'm telling you how to write code, but unless you actually sit down and try to do it, you're not going to get get good at it. OK. And uh, so that's pretty cool. OK, now I think I've got one more to go for a. Variable Zoog. Zoog will rise from below the screen and fly off into space above the screen. Zoog's eyes will be covered randomly, as, colored randomly as Zoog moves. OK, so here we have a program. I won't, I won't go through all these details here. Let me just run it. So here comes Zoog. Looks like he's having a mental problem there. There he is. It's like a rocket flying off into space. OK, so what am I doing? I begin by defining a bunch of variables as floating point variables. Zoog's position, Zoog X, Zoog Y, almost surely, right? This is what these are mean, is eye color, red, green, blue. I avoid setup, set up the size. Here I'm writing some comments about what's happening with the program. Zoog X and Zoog Y are initialized. That was initialized. OK, they're defined up here, but notice I'm not giving them a value. So Zoog X is defined to be the width of the window divided by two. The Y position, the height, height plus 100. Zoog starts below the screen. Remember, as Y increases, we're going down. And so this is low, what height plus 100. Now let's see what happens as we execute the loop and void draw. Background stays 255. Notice it's redrawing the background every time. OK, ellipse mode, rec mode, this is drawing Zoog. Is, so setting ellipse mode to be center, the rectangle, which we use for Zoog's body, is mode center. We're drawing Zoog's body, 150. Drawing ellipse, Zoog's head here depends on Zoog X and Zoog Y. Notice the size of the ellipse isn't changing. Zoog's eyes, the red, green, and blue in Zoog's eyes are going to be random numbers from 0 to 255. And then we're filling Zoog's eyes with these random values. Now we're the position of the these ellipses that we're drawing for the eyes depends on Zoog X and Zoog Y. And Zoog X and Zoog Y down here, Zoog moves up. So we changing not the X values stays the same, but the Y value is decreasing by one. We can make him move faster by cheating changing it to a five. So we're decreasing the Y value of five, which will cause Zoog to move up faster, but we're decreasing the value of Y more quickly. Let's run this. There we go. He's really taken off there. OK. So now notice that all, all of the different features of Zoog's body here are going to have to change. OK, and um, these are the initial values for Zoog X and Zoog Y. The Zoog X, the X position of everything that we're drawing in Zoog's body is not changing. So as we go through here, the, the only thing that's changing is the Y position on Zoog's body, which is causing him to go straight up. I could add change in the X position. Zoog X equals, let's write Zoog X equals Zoog, okay, Zoog Y. Okay, what's going to go on with that? It means we're decreasing, if this is decreasing the Y value, this is then going to be decreasing the X value. And I think I need to make that uppercase. So if I 
not, I'll get an error there. And I'm missing the semicolon. And I think because Zug Y is decreasing, I think Zug's body is going to move off to the left. Let's let's try this. Oh, I put in a colon, not a semicolon. You see that? It gave me an error. There we go. Zug's body moving off to the left. That's because decreasing X is to the left. Um, now, I propose, I could propose here a, a challenge to you in that See if you can figure out how to make Zug go in a circle around the screen. So instead of moving straight up and or here moving on a diagonal off to the left, and this is a little bit complicated to make him move in a circle. Okay, so it's not one of the homework questions yet anyway. So I'm saying, I mean, you see how to make him move up See how to make him move down. Um, can you make him move in a circle? Um, that'll, I think that's going to be more complicated than you might think. Um, and so uh, and I might be asking too much. Um, and um, you have to remember what the equation of a circle is. And the ISO, you want him to move, Zug to move in such a way that he traces out a circle. So the Y value will depend on what the X value is, or, or the other way around, the X value and the Y value. Here, the Y value is just constantly decreasing, but you don't want it to decrease. You want it to perhaps decrease and then increase and then decrease and then increase. So making Zug move in a circle is is uh, mathematically is a bit more complicated. And now as I'm asking you to think about it, um, it could be too complicated to ask right now. I, I would have to think about it for a while. It's not something I could write down super easy. Um, and uh, because uh, I never thought about it before, I'm just thinking about it as I'm talking here, which is probably a big mistake. Um, to begin, we well, might want to think, how could I make Zug move up and then bounce off the top of the screen and then move down? This would be easier. You know, Zug move up, he hits the top of the screen and it reflects and starts to move down. He hits the bottom of the screen. He reflects and starts to move up. I think that would be a bit easier. But again, com complicated in that because you're not used to thinking in these ways. Um, it could be it could be complicated. So again, I could be asking you uh, too much here. So I think the circle thing might be too complicated. I don't know. Depends, I guess, on how really clever and, and smart you are, at least to some extent. But it's kind of a piano moment. Unless you've been practicing this stuff for a long, long time, you know, how to do these kinds of things will not immediately occur to you. And uh, so whenever I am confronted with a problem that's complicated, that I haven't done before. Then um, I start doing simple things first. Like I, I see how to move Zug up, then I saw how to move Zug on a diagonal off to the left. Okay, now then I would say, well, how can I make him perhaps move by a sine wave, left or right? up and down. How can, might, might I do that? And um, so I b sl do slightly more complicated things, step by step by step by step. So I kind of force myself to go through a slow process 
of trying to learn how to do things a little bit at a time. I don't try to grab everything all at once and do everything all at once. I, I consider that to be a, 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 an important piece of advice. You know, um, when you know, great thinkers have done things, let's imagine Albert Einstein, he didn't do the general theory of relativity first. He did the special theory of relativity, which is much, much simpler. Um, and um, in, in fact, I could probably explain the special theory of relativity and how it works to you guys. You don't even need calculus to do the special theory of relativity. So, uh, and then we jumped off and he tried to do the general theory of relativity. Turns out that Einstein didn't know all the math that he needed. He didn't know the math. So he ended up having to learn new math in order to solve this physics problem, which is why it took him several years to do that general theory of relativity. And, you know, it's quite possible he got some help uh, from some of the greatest mathematicians of the day. I, I think I think that's a bit unclear. I've read several biographies of Einstein, and um, you know, so he would go out and he would give talks to people about his work on the general theory, rather okay, and he would talk about where he was stuck. So in essence, he was going out to the physics community, seeing if anybody had any ideas to help him do certain things. So. Um, it took Einstein a long time to do these things because they were initially beyond his capability. And all the time as we learn, learn new things, we're learning things that are beyond our previous capability. And we have to take baby steps, okay? Baby steps, we increase the complexity of what we're doing just a little bit at a time. And, uh, and as we do that, our understanding becomes more clear. So I'm thinking asking you to do a circle is probably too much. Um, and because to get there, you'd have to do baby steps and it would probably occupy a lot of time. So, okay, I don't have anything else to say here on this for today, let me close this off um, and um, we have the homework for this upcoming week um, if you want to um, you could uh, send me the PDE program you know that is in fact the processing program so in the last for last week you sent me uh, some screenshots and you sent me a word file, but you could actually, when you save the processing program, you could actually email me that processing program. That way I can run it. Because what I did on your for your homework this week is I copied the code out of your word file, put it in the processing and ran it. And that was okay, that worked. Um, in fact, let's leave it that way. Um, and um, let's just leave it that way because that worked. I don't want to add an extra complication. Okay, now let me, uh, there we go. Hey, uh, hey, all you people. Um, do you have any questions? Okay, I'm not hearing any questions. So um, we have a question. Okay. Well, uh, you know my email, you can email me questions. And um, so with that, I guess, uh, 
Let's see, somebody. Okay, no, sir, it's clear. I'm glad it's clear. Um, you'd be surprised how many people find uh, doing computer programming so uh, terribly confusing. And um, I'm glad it's uh, it's clear. Okay, guys, uh, have a great uh, rest of the week and uh, turn in your homeworks on time, okay? Because some people are kind of lagging on that. Get your homeworks in on time, please, because I like to sit down and then begin grading them. And if they're not all in on time, it kind of messes up that process for me. So like I said, if you have a good excuse, let me know, but just don't assume, okay, that it's always okay to turn them in late. Okay, so get your homeworks done. Oh, by the way, I uh, heard from the rector that uh, uh, the Naren campus uh, for comms and media and for computer science received accreditation for five years, which is what they were going for. Uh, so uh, it looks like you're all going to be getting legitimate degrees and graduating from an accredited university. Okay, I'll see you all then. Let me stop recording.